One of the fun things about talking at Here We Still Stand or at Here We Still Stand adjacent events is that you are told on what you will be speaking. You get a type, I shouldn't universalize, maybe this is just me. I get told, maybe Dan trusts everyone else, uh, so I get told, here's what you're, you're talking on, um, go. And so Dan Price told me this a while back, and he said it was gonna be uh, a God, the God, who eats and drinks with sinners. So for the past couple months, I have just been diving deep into all the stuff I can about eating and drinking historically. I'm gonna give you an outline of where we're going with my talk today. We're gonna to start out by going to Mark 2. And Mark 2 is really gonna anchor us. We're gonna start there, we're gonna end there. After Mark 2, I wanna talk about some of the most significant meals in history. Then I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the last meals of the condemned. And that stuff gets dark, so we'll move fast. Um, and, and then we'll get to the point and it's a point I'm gonna make over and over and over just so we're clear. The point of my talk today is that Jesus is not afraid of being sullied by association or, rep or reputation. Jesus, this God who eats and drinks with us is not afraid of being sullied by association or reputation. And I think that's really, really good news. And then I might end with the story of an omelet We'll see how we're doing. <laughs> I've now talked now a couple times, here we still stand events, and it just so happens that this is the third time my talk centers back on Mark 2. And I've probably talked more about Mark 2 than any other passage uh, in the Bible. It is, uh, it is a chapter that is in, invigorating and... and uh, it starts out with the, the paralytic. Remember the story of the, the friends bringing their friend to Jesus? I think the last year we still stand, that, that was my topic. And the idea that it's, it, who you associate with is important. Before Jesus heals the man, what does he do? He looks at the faith of the friends. It says he sees their faith and forgave his sins. What do we do with that? I don't know. Let the, the systematizers maybe fiddle but it's a pretty awesome picture. So right after he does that, Jesus goes and he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. So he has just done something with association with the paralytic, and now Jesus is going to associate himself with sinners and tax collectors. And that goes right into the two great little conversations in Mark 2. The first about uh, the question about fasting and John's disciples are kind of bummed that Jesus' disciples aren't fasting. And Jesus says, this isn't the time for fasting. This is the time for feasting. He's just been feasting. And then that goes right into him rebuking the disciples on getting the Sabbath wrong because this it is not a time to be dour, but a time to celebrate, a time to feast. Association and reputation. I saw one commentator call this the chapter about blasphemy and bad company. I think there's great comfort and hope in the God who eats and drinks with us. Now, when it comes to, to eating, we don't have the same kind of uh, uh, eating patterns that the ancient world had, right? We eat, we're on the go, we're cafeteria style, but to sit down and eat with someone, in, it, that implied so much, it implied a home, it implied hospitality, it implied the money to prepare, the time to meet with someone over food was was something really important. And just about every important historical event, we can tie back to some meal. There's a, a historian, Struan Stevenson, who wrote a book, The Course of History, 10 Meals That Changed the World. He goes into the Congress of Vienna, 
Churchill's birthday in 1945 when Stalin and Roosevelt and uh, Churchill are, are trying to, to figure out the end of World War II and how they come together over a meal. The, the Ann Carcary Castle dinner of 1928 when the four big oil companies, the men got together and essentially divvied up the entire world. Four companies. Or the Black Dinner. The Black Dinner is one of my favorites. The, what happened at the Black Dinner is you had the Stuart King. Stuart King was still young. This is in the, the 1400s. And uh, they, there's a, a regent, the Douglases, and the Douglases, and the Stuarts are fighting. And the Stuarts say to the Douglases, come to our castle and all will be well. Well, as everyone sat down for the meal, they took off the, you know, the, they revealed the main dish and it was a black bull head. And everyone knew that that meant everyone was going to die. The Douglases would be killed. Uh, there's actually a, a repeat of this about 100 years later. And then George R.R. R. Martin, you know, the Red Wedding? That's what he took it from, this significant meal. There's something about eating together. There's something about talking about what we ate. What would you eat? What would be your last meal ever. And you'd be very surprised to know how many books there have been written on the last meals, especially of those who are about to be executed. Stuff gets dark fast. It's wild. One of the books uh, is actually a cookbook, and it's called Meals to Die For. <laughs> Not cool. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, and then there's the other one, Honestly, no seconds. <laughs> what are they doing? In 1985, Pizza Hut ran a commercial of a guy calling Pizza Hut because he wanted their new pizza pie for his last meal in prison. It had just turned out that there was a guy who was executed who did the same thing, and Pizza Hut really quickly had to pull the, the, the commercial. We're fascinated by these things. What's the last meal? Why is this? Why are there so many books and cookbooks about the last thing that someone ate? I think one of the really interesting ideas behind this is that it's a vestige of the old public execution, right? That used to be a spectacle. We would go out and see people die. And, and why did we do that? Identity. That's them, this is us. Why were public executions so popular? Because some kind of atonement was happening. A real person, somebody, somebody like me but not me. Public execution is, in a way, just like association. on the Christian History Almanac, where I spend most of my time. A couple weeks ago, I did a weekend edition on my favorite or a collection of movies from church history. And I, I, I ran them down. And then I had to come back a couple weeks later on the show to admit that I missed one. I missed uh, Babette's Feast. Does anyone, I hear a, a, a warm sort of, yes, you like, everyone likes Babette's, Fe Babette's Feast. It's a, a wonderful Wonderful story. It's about uh, pietists in, in Denmark. Pietists, these, these faithful uh, Lutheran Christians who really, really wanted to do it right. And they spent so much of their time really piously trying to do it right that the, the joy of their faith was just kind of sucked out. And then the story, I won't give you the whole thing, but it sounds like a lot of us know it, uh, Babette, she is a, um, she's, she's working with these sisters and cooks them a feast. And it is a, a movie about the joy of feasting. It's a movie about luxury and grace in luxury and grace in hospitality. I think one of the things we see in Mark 2 is we see 
grace in luxury and grace in hospitality. How is luxury gracious? How do we find grace in luxury? In laughter. In the sign that I keep going back to over and over at the back of Calvary St. George in New York, enjoy your forgiveness. Feast. And grace as hospitality. I recently started uh, cooking. And uh, not, not, not just cooking in general, but cooking for my family. And I was one of these sort of vulture dads, sort of vulture cook dads, if you know what that is. Like, my wife is faithfully making the nutritious, repeatable dinners. You know, right? And then every once in a while, dad comes into the kitchen and dad's gonna cook you something, right? And so dad makes the bacon-wrapped steak thing with the cheesy potato bombs, and dad is obviously a better cook. <laughs> Half a stick of butter, dad's the best. And I have found that not only do I love doing that, but it's, it's turned into this, this, re, this regular habit where I, I cook and the boys are starting to get maybe a little tired of it because I cook things and then I ask them, how was that? How can I do it better? And we have this sort of ongoing conversation about making the perfect meals. So the boys and I play with ingredients. I try and make the, the perfect breakfast sandwich, the perfect grilled cheese, the perfect uh, burger, and I'm filled with such, such joy doing it. There is a grace in that luxury and there's a grace in that hospitality. And I feel it. And that takes me back to my heavenly father. If I feel it for my sons, how much more does it make God Happy? Does it pleasure him when I am receiving his hospitality and his luxury? When we're feasting together, how much more the Father? I am struck by association and reputation, and Mark 2 and Jesus not being afraid to be associated with us. You're only so far away from a bad reputation. The people you associate with might someday not associate with you anymore. The past couple of years of my life have been one of a, uh, uh, a head scrambling series of associations, and disassociations. Reputations made, reputations broken. There's one place that in spite of all of that, I can still feast, I can still experience the luxuriousness of the grace of our Heavenly Father. And that is with Jesus, the God who eats and drinks with sinners. Thank you. Amen.